Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I have a little bit of an accent, so you're going to have to put up with that. I am uh, from a place that's probably one of the greatest places in the world, and I'm hoping it'll become its own independent nation eventually. Texas, that's where I'm from. Um, so I'm hoping one day you'll have one less star on this flag here. Now, Scotland is where I'm from, actually, although I do live in Waco, Texas, where my wife is from. That's the reason I ended up in Texas. But I've been a Christian filmmaker for the last 10 years, and so I'll be making Christian conservative movies, and that's my job now. It's the transition from a hobby into my full-time work. And some of you may know my film, Indoctrination, which is about the public school system, and that was our, our, uh, one that we're most well-known for. And I want to thank Freedom Project for supporting that film and inviting me here as well for a tour of Wisconsin, which I'm not just pandering, it is one of my favorite states. You've got terrific weather, Scottish weather, which I love as well, so I'm really, really enjoying it. And it's great to get out of Texas. I love Texas. It's also good to leave us at times as well. I'm going to start by just showing you the trailer of our new film, Wait Till It's Free, which is about healthcare. So let me just hit the, the go button and you can enjoy uh, the trailer, short trailer about Wait Till It's Free. When I sign this bill, health insurance reform becomes law in the United States of America. The left in America has been trying for 50 years to get control of the health care system. Moving towards a single-payer system could very well make sense. I'm all for a single-payer system. I want it single-payer. Instead of having a single-payer or a national health service style plan, it often ends up being I said, I don't know, seven, eight thousand dollars, and she said, no, it's twenty thousand dollars. The buyer doesn't know what the prices are and can't do anything about the prices, even if he knows what the prices are. The American system is barely capitalistic at all because there's so much distortion to the system by how involved the government already is in the whole process. For some person to stick his Pinocchio nose between me and my patient. That person is an interloper. The market is just begging and pleading to help out, and yet all we get from Washington is obstructionism. When government comes up with a bad idea, there's no way to get rid of it. They don't solve the problems. Capitalism solves problems. The long-run solution to the U.S. fiscal problem is death panels and sales taxes. To say that there is no death panel may be naive, but I think worse than that, it's deceptive. The people who will suffer most when the government gains control, the children or the old people, these are the ones whose care will be rational. Thank you, Flat Panel. God bless you. If the government can tell you that you have no religion in your business, they can take away your faith, they can take away a lot of things. Military veterans are dying needlessly because of long waits at some U.S. veterans' hospitals. And if they died, they were just crossed off as if they had never shown up for care. So tell me, what do you think of the actual health care? Really? The British have been subject to a competence trick, but their system is the best, when actually it's either the worst or amongst the worst in the Western world. Elderly and vulnerable patients were left unwashed, unfed, and without fluids. Governments are not very good at running things. Why should we expect them to be any better at running hospitals? Don't imagine that if you go down this road, you're going to be able to change your mind later. We can say right now that the key issue is we do not want socialized medicine. Okay, I think that's a film. I think it's a film that we've made for people like you. We do a lot of preaching to the choir because we know you've, I, it's great to come among some activists. I've been a political activist for years. I ran for office in Scotland and failed miserably. Came over here and I've been involved in the political scene, particularly the pro-life work, I think is uh, uh, my priority amongst making these films on these big issues. So we are, in, in one way, although we're politically involved, we're a little bit detached, which is good as well. We're making these films on these big issues and it's not just a political story, although that's part of it. It's a bigger story, a moral story, and a story that has solutions that are also out with the political system. And we'll get into that in a, a little bit. Now, I wanted to give you a, an idea of, well, why do we call it Wait Till It's Free? Does anyone know who coined the phrase Wait Till It's Free? P. 
P.G. O'Rourke is the guy. So I've been a P.G. O'Rourke fan. I always liked P.G. O'Rourke because he was funny. He, made, and he writes these great entertaining books about conservatism to some extent, conservative and libertarian. Um, but his phrase, wait till it's free, was, came around during uh, the big push, Hillary Care, during the 1990s. And I wasn't over here during the 1990s. But his point was, you know, if we, if we go towards socialized medicine, and we go towards the path that Hillary was proposing, you're going you're gonna to learn what free really is. <laughs> and this is the story. Of course, there's no such thing as free, right? We know the phrase, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Free always comes with a price. It's not always a, a tangible cost price, but it's going to be something else. In fact, when we look at the National Health Service in, the great, in great Britain, where I'm from, the cost is actually much worse than money. It's to do with the, your actual life, and we'll go into that in a minute. I want to start, though, with a question that... Um, Stephen Brill begins when he talks about health care, and that is the issue of uh, not of who pays, because that's the normal debate about health care. The question is who pays? Is it the government or is it uh, private? Is it individuals that pay for it or is it third party? And that's the question that's relevant to ask that. But the big issue that Stephen Brill brings up in his uh, landmark essay in, uh, in Time magazine, um, he brings up the idea of before you even get to the issue of who pays, start with the question of why is it so expensive? Because that really is the big issue in healthcare. We're looking for ways to pay for these big bills, but why do we have these bills in the first place? And we go into that a lot in the film when we explain the problem. I'm going to play a couple of clips that are to do with healthcare prices. We had to have an MRI for Claudia. They gave me a quote of about $1,800 for that. Then I called the hospital to see if how much they would charge, and they said it'd be about $3,000. So we decided to go ahead and go to the hospital. My wife called me up after the MRI, and she'd gotten the bill, and she said, guess what the bill is? And uh, I said, you know, from her tone of voice, I knew it was high, so I said, I don't know, seven, eight thousand dollars, and she said, "No, it's twenty thousand dollars." <laughs> we have a radiologist bill, which wasn't even included in the twenty thousand dollars. Then we had the anesthesiologist, which was another bill as well. So it was an expensive procedure. <laughs> okay, so uh, the, Claudia is the daughter, sweet little girl, and she's doing fine now. So these massive bills. So this is a family with not a lot of money. He's a pastor, and he works part-time in a dairy, and uh, his wife works at, stays at home, uh, homeschools the family. Uh, their total bills are over $300,000, and what happened was their daughter just was born with spina bifida. So it's one of those things, we call it an act of God, well, everything's an act of God, essentially, but it, it, we talk about those kinds of things. It's something that people can't avoid. It's, their daughter has spina bifida, and of course, they go into the hospital system, and they're given these massive Massive bills. I want to give another story here of another person. I'm trying, you know, part of the reason we do what we do. Why do we make documentaries instead of writing books? Although we have books that we write too, we do documentaries because story makes sense of the facts. And so when you see this family and you see little Claudia running around, you realize this is a real story. It's beyond politics. It's real. It really is to do with real people and their real stories. Here's another story of Roger. such a discrepancy in the way that medical bills were being uh, billed to me. I had to have another MRI done at another hospital, and instead of an $1,800 bill for an identical test, I was billed $5,500. I said, you know, you're charging me $5,500 for an MRI. I also did a little further research and checked with an insurance company and find out that they pay you $750 for this test and you willingly and gladly accept their $750. And she looked at me and she says, yes, but we have an agreement with the insurance company. Yeah. I said, you know, that really isn't fair. Now, I don't r really like the, the use of the word, it's not fair, because my kids use it all the time. I mean, that's the most common, it's not fair. And so 
would have banned that phrase, but it's true. It's not fair. And we've got this crazy situation in America. Now, I'm an apologist for America and American values. I, I think I was, um, I'm an American citizen now. I married an American. And, uh, but before I even met my wife, I had, I think, American values based on my conservative reading. So I, as I said, I was reading P.G. O'Rourke. I was also reading Hayek and my seasons. Got a, an idea of what liberty really means, which we don't have any of in Scotland. We really don't have a lot of an understanding of what liberty means. So when you lose, when we see a country lose liberty in terms of health care, and you see what is going on, this is pre-Obamacare as well. So remember that this film is not essentially just criticizing Obamacare. It's criticizing the system as a whole and all of the things that have gone wrong with it. I'm going to explain some of the things that went have gone wrong because obviously there's two families with medical needs that weren't their fault and they have these massive bills and because they don't have insurance they're paying the very most which is illogical these the poorest people in America pay the very highest bills and they're, in the film we explain that and we're going to talk we're, I'm going to play a clip with Stephen Brill Stephen Brill is a journalist. Time magazine published his uh, article, Bitter Pill. He's not a conservative, um, but what he says I think is really relevant for uh, We take it another angle. He argues for uh, uh, cost price controls within the healthcare system. We take it a different direction. We think of a better solution. But what he says here in this clip I think is, is correct and very relevant to the solutions to the problem that we just played in the last two clips. Price. For everything associated with healthcare is just way too high in terms of, in comparison to what any other country spends, often to produce better results than we produce in the United States. In any kind of real marketplace, the buyer has some uh, relevant balance of power over the seller, but in the healthcare marketplace, the buyer has no power. The buyer doesn't know what the prices are. Um, he can't do anything about the prices, even if he knows what the prices are. So to give you an example, uh, this patient at MD Anderson, who was suffering from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, just to get his first transfusion of a drug that would save his life, the hospital charged him $13,000. Uh, when you follow the money, you can find that it costs the hospital maybe $3,000 for that drug, and it costs the drug manufacturer maybe three or four hundred dollars for that drug. They were charging uh, a patient for a little box of gauze pads, eighty-eight dollars, and you could buy those for you know, a fraction of that cost at the local uh, you know, CVS or Walgreens. Okay, so when you see a clip like that and you hear those stories, just like you heard Claudia's story and Roger's story, and then you're hearing of the cancer victim who's getting charged a markup of thousands of percent based on the, the, the cost that the, the, pharma, the pharmaceutical company to produce that medicine. Of course, there's R&D costs, and we're including those. And then the cost of the hospital charges and the bill that's sent to this end user. It, what is going wrong there? And what we're realizing when we research this film is that the healthcare system operates in, in no way in relation to free market principles, no idea of supply and demand, and no idea of prices. There's a complete lack of price transparency, which is one of the biggest problems. It's interesting that along with price, lack of price transparency, we've found that there's lack of political transparency as well with Obamacare. Isn't that one of the crit criticisms of Obamacare? You know, vote for the bill and you'll find out what's in it. You know, and, and then they hide the prices of their, their insurance policies as long as they can on the exchange. And you see that lack of price transparency. I think the political system's learning from the medical industry there. The medical industry has been hiding prices because of the way we've decided to do health care in America. And that is an over-reliance on government and an over-reliance on third-party pay. So um, I've got another clip here which goes into another important aspect of, of why American healthcare, the American healthcare system is broken. And so people tend to criticize the American system by saying, well, isn't it too capitalistic? My response is that the American system is barely capitalistic at all. Uh, you hardly see the effects of free enterprise because there's so much distortion to the system by how involved the government already is in the whole process. I think something like 45 cents out of every dollar in the healthcare world in the United States is currently controlled by the United States government. 
Okay. So, you know, when I, as I said, I was an apologist. I'm always an apologist abroad for America. And the, when people talk about the British healthcare system, it's funny, British people are very optimistic. They, they tell you how terrible something is, and then they'll defend it in principle. So they sort of dissociate the, the socialist idea from the actual bad service they're, they're receiving. Um, my purpose when I'm over there is to, to let them know that the reason we have all these problems in the healthcare system in America isn't because of capitalism. It isn't because of our commitment to the free market and healthcare and then the, the bad guys just take massive advantage over us. It's not that at all. It's the fact that we don't have a free market. In, a, in fact, in, a, in many ways, the system that we have is worse because we have another system, which we're going to uh, show you in a minute, called crony capitalism. And that is actually worse because it's closer to fascism where you get big players with special interests controlling government for their, for their own monetary gain. And that's more of what we've got than the people abroad who have the socialist healthcare system. So we don't have this free market. So it was really important for people uh, out with our country to know that, but it's also important for Americans to know that as well. Now, this is a historical battle that we've been fighting. And Obamacare, I try and describe Obamacare because Republicans are like, well, we're going to repeal Obamacare. And that's great. Please repeal Obamacare. But that's not it. <laughs> Obamacare was bad. Obamacare, in my mind, is just doubling down on the bad ideas that came before it. So that's the individual mandate, the employer mandate, the over-reliance on third-party pay. They're just using the force of government to make those things happen. So you, you have to fix it as a whole. And it was the history of the socialized socialization of healthcare goes way back and some people take it back to the Flexner report which uh, was the AMA and the beginning of licensing and then you, but I think it's better to look at it from the social security perspective when they established social, social security uh, the, the goal was uh, uh, along with that bill or included in that bill was for a nationalized healthcare system in 1935, and Britain got there in the late 40s after the war. But there was this intent to bring in socialized medicine at a very early stage in America. And what's been happening is every 10 years or so, we get this big boost. You know, they try again, and they try again. The left has been really good at just, you know, boiled frog uh, us up to that point. And so I'm going to play some one of my heroes, a great guy in many ways, not perfect, of course, but on this issue, spoke very clearly. Later, he didn't do so well in the healthcare issue, but on this, this is one of the greatest statements that we managed to find on healthcare liberty. By the early 1960s, Operation Coffee Cup began. This campaign hired a well-known actor to speak out against socialized medicine. My name is Ronald Reagan. I have been asked to talk on uh, several subjects that have to do with the problems of the day. We can say right now that we want no further encroachment on these individual liberties and freedoms. And at the moment, the key issue is we do not want socialized medicine. Tell him that you believe in government economy and fiscal responsibility, that you know that governments don't tax to get the money they need. Governments will always find a need for the money they get. And that you demand the continuation of our traditional free enterprise system. And behind it will come other federal programs that will invade every area of freedom as we have known it in this country. Until one day we will awake to find that we have socialism. And if you don't do this, and if I don't do it, one of these days you and I are going to spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Isn't that great? Could you imagine? I mean, someone could say that speech right now about Obamacare. That was about Medicare and Medicaid in 1961. We lost that battle. We've lost all these other battles in between. So it's not, if we focus on Obamacare, we got to remember there's all these things that happen. There's HMOs under Nixon. There's, uh, you know, HIPAA that came uh, through the Clintons. Um, there's, well, Zemtala, uh, which is where hospitals are forced to take people. Um, who are, don't have the ability to pay, and that happened in the 80s under Reagan. Um, so, uh, you know, then George uh, Bush uh, senior, Jr. with uh, Medicare Part D. So there's been these big extensions and expansion of the socialization of, of, of health care in America to the point that Obamacare is really bad, but not as bad as all of the stuff that came before it, as we saw with the clip with Tony Dale. Um, he talks about it being 50%, and that's about right, but you then you, you extend, I would extend that because the other 50% 
isn't socialized, but it's heavily controlled through licensing of doctors, through the, the whole licensing system, through uh, the, all of the regulations and codes that go into making healthcare a difficult thing to perform and therefore often an expensive thing to perform. Um, what's going to happen, in my mind, with Obamacare is that it's not going to do particularly well. I think the Republicans have a good chance of having success against it in, in certain aspects of it, so I think they'll chip away at it. I think, though, the end goal is going to be single payer. That's what they really want. And I don't just say this. I'm going to show you some clips to back it up, which is what, why we make documentaries. It's not just me saying something. We're going to show you the evidence. The left in America has been trying for 50 years to get control of the health care system. It's one-sixth of our economy. There is a tremendous amount of power in being able to make a life or death decision about somebody else or about 300 million people. That's power. That's real power. And that's what the left craves. The most powerful position a government can have in healthcare is what's called a single payer system. That's a system where the government covers all the healthcare costs in a country, similar to countries like Canada and much of Europe. How do we get the federal government to take care of this business? I happen to be a proponent of a single payer to the healthcare plan. I think that the idea of moving uh, towards a single payer system could very well make sense. That's the kind of system that you have in most industrialized countries around the world. Don't think we can have a tremendous number of people who want a single payer system. I mean, I'm all for a single payer system. Uh, eventually. I think what we have to do, though, is work with what we've got to close the gap. So, so when, you, when you tell uh, someone that single pair is coming, they're the quotes you need to use. There's many more of them, and we don't use them all in the film, but th this, is, this is what's going to happen. We're going to Obamacare. It's very likely it's going to not do well. It is not doing well. It is a mess, a messy legislation. I'd say that it was, it was born partly out of socialism, partly out of um, crony capitalism. We're going to play a clip in a minute about the, the details of crony capitalism. Um, but single payers coming down the line. You look at the you look at the left in America. They have this fantasy that what happens in the UK is is great and uh, social. You know they, they don't have any guns. That's great that they don't have any guns and they seem to manage fine. Of course they don't manage fine. And then they look at their healthcare system. And our film goes into that in detail about what happens in the UK healthcare system. But I'm going to show you a clip about crony capitalism because I think that's such an important thing. Crony capitalism. We have to be very clear that crony capitalism isn't capitalism. It is a form of control over the, the capitalist market for the advantage of big players. And it is, it was the re, it's the reality check that the political action that you have messes out one of the biggest tiers of government, which is K Street. And K Street is where all the lobbyists are. And they're the people, they don't care about what you think. They don't care about how you vote because they already know they have a lot of power because they pay for the political process. And we'll go into that right now. The way things usually work in Washington is that instead of having a single payer or a national health service style plan like what the left wanted, or a free market in health care, which was not what we had before, but some conservatives were advocating, there's this mixture. And the mixture of business and government, a lot of people think, oh, well, this is a good compromise. But it often ends up being crony capitalism. Whenever government is getting bigger, somebody is getting that money. And that somebody is usually going to be whoever can hire the best lobbyists, whoever can hire the former congressmen, whoever can pay a lot for the lawyers to learn their way around the rules. And that is not going to be mom and pop. Okay, so we're not discouraging political action by any means, but you have to know how the system works to be able to fight it properly. The AMA, um, uh, the Hospital Association of America, the insurance industry, the pharmaceutical industry all supported Obamacare. Why do they support Obamacare? Because they were one of the biggest beneficiaries of Obamacare. These are the guys that are sitting there waiting for socialization because it benefits them and they can start charging much more than their product or service is worth. Everyone wants to get paid by an insurance company rather than competing in the open market that pushes them to reduce, reduce costs and improve services. That's the, that's the scary thing for these big companies that have ceased to function within the free market. So when, it's, when you look at Obamacare and we talk about socialism, it is, he is a socialist, but what I believe is that Obama 
utterly compromised. I think he would have had single payer if he could have. But he knew that the way the politics works in Washington is they had to align himself with the big players, the big money players, the pharmaceutical industry being a bigger pair in some years more so than the military industrial complex. So you know, be aware this is not a small thing. The pharmaceutical industry runs the major campaigns in America or pays for them at least. So let's talk a little bit about Britain um, and, and the National Health Service. Uh, I'm, I think it's good for me. I, I get the benefit of being an outsider when I'm talking to American issues. So I can come and look at American issues. So we did, and it's noticeable in our last film, Indoctrination, we talked about education. And the, one of the most no, noticeable aspects of, this, of socialized America is the big yellow bus, in my mind. I think, the big, you know, if you go to Korea, North Korea, and everyone's wearing the same jumpsuit and hat, it's a clue that you're in a socialist country because everyone's wearing the same color. Well, what do we have in America? We have these big buses that drive around the country that prove to me that there's a socialist agenda behind the, the, the public school system. Every state has the same color buses by law. And, uh, of course, they do some insidious things. Nationalized... Um, so uh, being an outsider is a big benefit, um, but I can also compare to what people are doing ac across the pond, uh, and I can talk to this, the problem with socialized medicine from experience. And the, the interesting thing about that is there's, there's so many bad experiences that I could relate. I have a, a feed on my uh, you know, Google Alerts, and every day I get messages about what's going on in the National Health Service right now. And every day there's another horrific story about what's happening to the National Health Service. And it's stories of people that are... Um, Deprived service, you know, we talk about the public schools. Well, if, if the public schools are bad, well, that's a big problem, especially in terms of quality and education. When health services are bad, that's deadly to people. And people are dying in the UK because of their lack of, of, of ability to get the treatment, life-saving treatment that they need when they need it. Because healthcare is like one of those things. You only think about it at all when you really need it. And that's the worst case because the people that run the National Health Service, the problem with the, the, the health service being run by the government is what it, they're not serving the interests of the consumer or the patient. They're serving a political agenda. So what, is, what, is the, what are the priorities of a socialist country in terms of delivering health care? Well, it's abortion, abortion rights, free abortions on the National Health Service. There's Sex change operations for free. There's sex change reversal operations. Can you believe that? There's um, uh, just read a couple of days ago uh, a, a sperm bank for lesbians just opened up. So that's so the issue there is what is healthcare? Well, when we all talk about healthcare, we're thinking if I have a heart attack or if I break my leg. Whatever it is, those, that's our concern when we talk about healthcare. When Obama and the left and everyone else talks about healthcare, they're not thinking about that. They're thinking about their agenda. So we have this small circle over here, and we're talking about healthcare to them. But don't be mistaken, they, are, they have this big circle, and it's mental health, which is about controlling you. And control, you know, if you if you've got a mental health problem in their mind, well, it's goodbye to your guns. You know, that's what health is to them. Health is about ultimate power. So if they take over health, they take over what you eat, what you drink, what you do, who do you talk to? All those things are, are, are we, we we're seeing the power grab here. I'm going to play a clip about uh, the British healthcare system, and uh, this clip is with Theodore Dalrymple, the conservative writer. National Health Service is idolised in a way which is completely inexplicable, I think, to strangers and to foreigners, because foreigners have a fear of the National Health Service. The British uh, worship it, partly because I think they have very little else now uh, to be proud of. There was recently a study by the Commonwealth Fund about healthcare systems in the Western world. The British were the most satisfied with their national health service, although on all objective measures it was inferior to practically all the other systems that they looked at. And the British have been, if you like, subject to a confidence trick that their system is the best, when actually it's either the worst or amongst the worst in the Western world. 
Theodore Dalrymple. He's an excellent guy. He's um, cons- one of the few conservatives over there. We don't have a lot of conservative writers. All the conservatives ended up over here eventually um, <laughs> for good reason. Um, but Theodore Dalrymple talks about that. The British people are very optimistic about you know, the idea behind health care. It's, it's our third rail. I mean, we just have a bunch of third rails, so all of the welfare state, really, but particularly the National Health Service, so much so that all of the political parties, including the so-called conservative ones, and that would be the, the, the Conservative Party and the uh, UK Independence Party, both of them stand behind the principle of a nationalized health care system. It would be impossible for them to be elected based on a, on a truly liberty-oriented. And that's the case with the British. British politics is really bad. I ran for office. The pro-life issue was taken off the table, and that's why we ran as the pro-life party. The pro-life issue is off the table there. Here, it's still, I mean, this is why I like American politics, because there's still morality, Christian values is still a key issue. Over there, it's gone through, and that's because they control entirely the education system, totally socialized uh, education in principle, and they control the healthcare system. The, The amount of leverage that you have politically over the voting class is huge because you control their very life and death. I mean, that's the issue, is if you want cradle-to-grave socialism, well, the truth is, is that is a big, the big benefit of government is they control everything about you. They even control the grave part, you know, when it happens to you, that's, they actually make that happen. We'll get into that in a sec. I've not got too long, so I'm, we've got another clip from Daniel Hannan. To take control of their own health care, you hand that power over however you do it, with the best will of the world, to a bureaucracy that then literally has the power of life and death. Governments are not very good at running things. They weren't very good at running airlines. They weren't very good at building cars. They weren't very good at installing telephones. Why should we expect them to be any better at running hospitals? Okay, that makes sense, doesn't it? (laughs) British... Well, I don't understand why the British people can't understand that, that logic. They're fearful. They're fearful for one question that has a simple answer, and that is, what about the poor? And we answer that in the film. I don't know if we'll get to the clip, but the, the answer is very simple. The way that we should do health care is the way that we used to do health care, which was we had a free market. We had a system that actually worked pretty well. Even in Britain, they had private insurance and many private doctors. We had the, one of the best health care systems in the world, but that was before the National Health Service came along and nationalized it, because the, nation, the socialists come along and they claim the, the structure that you have built for their, themselves, right? So they do this all the time in America, where they claim what the great country of America has been built because of the socialism that we brought in. And it's not true at all. It was great because of the ideas that built it up. You've just usurped it and, and, and co-opted it for your, for your efforts. So, so that is what we're seeing there in Britain. Um, but the warning there, the reason we bring up the UK is that, the, and we have statements in the film that prove this, uh, where the people that arranged Obamacare and the progressives have looked to the UK as the model for what we're going to get. And we're going to talk about how bad that is with this clip here. And it's about the, uh, the, pretty much the end game of what socialized uh, medicine is. I went to meet with his doctor, Professor Patrick Pulicino, a British neurologist who, while taking care of his patient, was drawn into a national scandal that would reveal one of the worst aspects of the British healthcare system. At this particular time, he came in with a combination of pneumonia and seizures, and he was quite confused. He was a bit agitated. He wasn't an easy patient to manage from the nurse's point of view. I was sure that he could be gradually improved over a little bit of time with good nursing care. And so I went off one Friday, came back on Monday, and I went into his his room there, and I saw him just completely flat out. And I said, well, what's happened to this patient? When I was told that the patient had been put on the Liverpool Care Plan, I just told them they had to stop it. The pathway involved the removal of food, fluid and medicine, along with heavily sedating the patient until they died. Proclaimed as a way to make death easier, the method often caused the premature death of the patient. Within a couple of days, he, he was recovering. And in a couple of weeks, he'd been discharged home. This patient, if he'd been left on the path, he would have died, there's no doubt. So that doctor, pro-life doctor, Christian doctor, came back after his, after his weekend, found this doctor on what's called the Liverpool Care Pathway, 
patient was going to die, would have died. You only die without food and fluids and medicine. You're going to die in a day or two. And uh, he managed to save him. Unfortunately, well, he lived 14 months, but he went into another hospital and got put on the, the pathway at another hospital and died on it. So what, what's going on there? And this is the, the really scary part of it, is that people work not entirely, but largely on economic incentives. You, you wonder about these doctors and nurses, and there's a moral component to the things that they were doing to their patients. But the bigger issue that's obvious to me is they're working... They, they're, the, th- the practice that they had with the Liverpool Care Pathway, pathway was based on the in- economic incentives that happened under socialized medicine. So socialized medicine reverses the incentives in a consumer-oriented medical healthcare system. You have demands, and the consumer has power, and you approach this healthcare system with your dollars to get a service out of them that's to your benefit. The exact opposite of that happens under a healthcare system where you're fully, you're fully indebted to this healthcare system. And what happens is they reallocate this wealth that they've taken from you through taxes, and then they decide how it's distributed back to you. And of course, as I said earlier, they're distributing it back to you based on its, their own um, pra- political priorities, which particularly involve the use of, you know, the, the favoring of abortion and all the rest of it. So I'm up against the end of my time, um, so I think we'll do a little... Anyone get any questions? I'm, I'm, I'll be here.